Jagudev. So today we're going to be speaking about um, Sri Ramanuja Acharya. I believe you've been, um, well, those of you who have, you've been participating in a series of lectures about various different saints. And so today is, is Sri Ramanuja Acharya, who we, of course, have in our temple altar. So our ties to him are a little bit more um, direct, let's put it like this, because of our previous affiliation to the Sri Sampradaya. And so I will give a little bit of a background context to Sri Ramanuja Acharya and the lineage to which he represents before I directly go into the life of Sri Ramanuja Acharya. It is a challenge because he lived 120 years. And so to fit that in today's lecture length is a problem. And so I'm doing a very summarized version of his life with some, let's say, marquee moments where I will expand a little bit more and then I can speak a bit more about what makes him um, or rather what makes his life story as inspiring as it is who he is and what he is, is a very different matter. I'm not going to be giving a, a let's say, lecture on the nature of Ramanuja Acharya as a being, but rather on the events that took place in his life and some of the things that he did, because I feel like they have more of an ex explanatory purpose for our lives. And it helps us to, if not navigate, then at least deal with some of the things that we, we have to deal with as well. Okay, So let's do that. I will try to contextualize as much as I can along the way. Um, obviously, we're starting a little bit later today because of prayers. And so if you afford me an extra 10, 15 minutes at the end to go past one, then I think we'll do a good job. So first of all, Sri Ramanuja Acharya, as we know, is the, the founding Acharya. Really, he is not the founding Acharya of Sri Vaishnavism. He is the one who uh, crystallized Sri Vaishnavism. That means, let's say, finalized it in its complete form. But he did not initiate the idea of Sri Vaishnavism, the precepts of Sri Vaishnavism. They actually predate Sri Ramanuja Acharya. And so as with all Vaishnava lineages, there is this idea that they originate from Bhagavan himself. Okay, So we have Sriman Narayan at the top of the parampara of the lineage. And from Sriman Narayan, it goes to Mahalakshmi. This is tradition. And I want to contextualize it in the sense that there is obviously no proof for any of this. It is not that I'm going to sit here and say, look, it was on this date that they had this conversation. And he was teaching Mahalakshmi philosophy. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that tradition says that this is the flow of grace. And I think that's a better way of understanding a flow of grace, but it doesn't necessarily mean a transmission of teaching because then it creates an awkward visualization of what's going on in Vaikuntha. I don't believe that philosophical teaching is going on in Vaikuntha. Right? But that's another topic. So then Mahalakshmi passes on this flow of grace to Vishwakshena. So Vishwakshena is, let's say, the, the general manager of Vaikuntha. He's not the boss, he's not the owner of the company, but he's like the CEO. And so he runs things on behalf of the real boss. And so if you make a Christian comparison, obviously we talk about heavenly beings, we have all the angels and all of this, but in Vaishnavism we say that we also have that, they're called the Vishnu Dutas. So they are the servants of Vishnu. They are transcendental beings. But they are managed, they are governed by Vishwaksena. So Vishwaksena is uh, the general of the servants of Narayana. And so he receives instruction. And then Vishwaksena incarnates on earth as Nam Alvar. So there are 12 Alvars. I will speak about them a little bit later. But the most active amongst them in terms of um, teaching and producing what we call Pashurams, which are verses slash poems. They're actually a mixture of the two. Um, they were produced predominantly by Nam Alvar. And so Nam Alvar traditionally is said to be the incarnation of Ishvakshena. None of these things are provable. 
Yeah, when we talk about it, this one is incarnation of that, that is incarnation of that. It is just we accept the realization or the vision of those that were around and made such a claim. So somebody looked at Namalva and said, this is Vishvaksena. Or Namalva might have revealed that to someone and then that information is passed on. So we always take it with a, a grain of salt. The same thing happens nowadays. Many claims can be made and we accept and we don't according to our mood. Yeah, But it is not that the authority or the, the truth of what they share must have as a basis this claim being true. Because if that is the case, then it is a very weak truth. If it makes no sense and the only reason we accept it is because, oh, but Nam Alvar is, Vish is Vishvaksena, that's a very, that's a fallacious argument. It's, it's false because you're saying it's an appeal to authority. There's nothing about the argument or the sharing in itself that is true. The only reason I'm giving it credibility is because who said it? Right? So we often do that in society. So if a celebrity says something, oh, it must be true. Why? Because someone famous said it. So this is an appeal to authority. It's logically fallacious. It's not true. Yeah? And so we can't do the same thing in the spiritual field. Oh, just because this one allegedly is the incarnation of so-and-so, so what he said must be the absolute truth. Yeah? Because there's no way for us to verify that this, any of this is true, incarnation-wise. I can make many claims about who Guruji is. How will you know? You say, well, you must know. Must I? Why? Because I'm wearing orange and I have a fancy name? Right? So you have to verify these things for yourself and they have to be coherent to you both intellectually and emotionally. And if you have your own recognition and acceptance of that or that you see me as being reliable beyond reason, beyond doubt, so to put it like this, um, then yes, you may accept my claims. Right? But we should not fall for this trap that everybody in the world does, which is an appeal to authority. If a doctor comes and says something about the the field of medicine, you will say, he must be right. Why? Because he's a doctor. Okay, well, what if 10 different doctors disagree? Then what? So we have to measure the, the validity of the argument on the argument's own strength, not on the power of who is saying it. Okay? With the exception of God. If God says something, you listen because it's God. <laughs> so now Malvar, as I said, he, he contributes the majority of the Pashurams in the body of work known as the Divi Prabandham, which we will come to. And this body of work is recovered miraculously by Nata Muni. So Nata Muni prayed to, to rediscover the Divya Prabandham, the writings of the Alvars. And as his prayer was successful, and he therefore received this <coughs> knowledge descending from these divine beings, because the Alvars are said to be all, all of them divine incarnations. Therefore, Nata Muni is often considered to be actually the first Acharya of Sri Vaishnavism. Because prior to him, these are divine incarnations. So this is not, in a traditional sense, an Acharya. So somebody who, as a, as a Jiva, acquires these uh, teachings and then sort of creates and, and propagates a philosophy. So therefore, Nata Muni is actually by, considered by many in, in the field of Sri Vaishnavism to be the first Acharya of Sri Vaishnavism. Okay? And then Nata Muni passes on the philosophy of the Alvars, the teachings of the Alvars, to Pundari Kaksha, who passes it on to Rama Mishra. So Rama Mishra is a curious figure because Mishra is a North Indian surname. It's not a Tamil surname. And actually, many of these personalities, they have an equivalent Tamil name that is used to denote them also. Um, but Rama Mishra was called Rama Mishra. Mishra means, in Sanskrit, it means when you mix things. So something that is mixed, we say it's Mishra. And so Rama Mishra was called as such because he was practicing both Vedanta and the Pancharatra. So Pancharatra and Vedanta were seen as two different disciplines at that time. So Pancharatra following the Agamas would have been a more ritualistic form. Not necessarily Mimamsa, but leaning more towards Mimamsa philosophy. And Vedanta is seen as a separate discipline. But because he accepted and practiced both, he reconciled the two. So Rama Mishra was taking Vedanta, which is more abstract philosophy, and matching it to more practical applications of Pancharatra. So he, was, he, he gained this title of Mishra. So he was Rama Mishra, okay, the one who mixes two. 
And he was the teacher of Yamunacharya. So Yamunacharya was the most prominent Vaishnava teacher at the time of Sri Ramanujacharya. So when Ramanujacharya was born, and as he grew up, he was actually first uh, in an Advaitin school, and we'll speak about that in just a little bit. But the prominent Vaishnava Acharya of his time was Yamunacharya. And Yamunacharya's teacher was Rama Mishra. So by the time Yamunacharya came into, into let's say, prominence, he was already imbibing the mentality of his guru Rama Mishra. Therefore, Vedanta and Pancharatra in a Vaishnava context were already seen as one thing. They were no longer seen as two different things being blended. It was the idea that the philosophical, let's say, domain of Vedanta always had a practical dimension. And that was found in the Pancharatra Agamas. So they didn't see it as two different disciplines from Yamuna onwards. Okay, So prior to Yamuna, there was this two different domains. Post Yamuna, they are one. So when we talk about Ramanuja as a philosopher, it, in, it includes within that statement the idea that he also propagated temple worship and temples and practical rituals. It's not to say that because he was a philosopher, he was an abstract thinker only. right? Because the, nowadays, even in the West, if you say someone's a philosopher, there is no assumption in that statement that there is any practical dimension to that philosophy. It is an intellectual domain, primarily speaking. Whereas from Yamuna Acharya onwards, in the Vaishnava context, philosophy, namely Vedanta, was always seen as necessarily having a practical domain. And for the Vaishnavas, that practical domain was found in the Pancharatra Agama. Do you get the point I'm making? Right? So you may say that philosophy takes on a practical application in the form of meditation, contemplation. That's fine. But for the Vaishnavas of South India, it was not that. The practical application was always the ritual worship of the Lord as found in the Pancharatra Agama. And this was put in place by Rama Mishra and passed on to Yamunacharya and eventually to Ramanuja. Okay, we'll come to that. Because it gives a context as to Ramanuja's thinking and to why he, he proposed philosophy within what appears to be a highly religious framework. Because the Pancharatra Agamas speak of a very religious framework. Yeah, it's all about ritual, temples, deities. Yeah, this is what we associate with church, with temple. And sometimes there's, there's a line of thought that says philosophy is beyond those things. Philosophy is something higher, deeper. We don't play these outside sort of material games. But we have to understand that in Ramanuja's mind, that does not exist because the two are seen as one. You cannot speak of philosophy being beyond temple worship. Temple worship is philosophy. You understand? So that is why I'm making this point. Okay, so then Yamunacharya attempted to initiate Ramanuja to pass on his teachings. This did not work because as he called Ramanuja, Yamunacharya unfortunately dies. And we speak about this later. And so later, Ramanuja takes sannyas initiation from Mahapurna. Mahapurna was a disciple of Yamunacharya. And therefore, we have the Sri Vaishnava Parampara. Okay, the flow of grace from Sri Manarayana to Sri Ramanujacharya. Okay? Good. As I showed you previously, the first earthly holder of that particular lineage's grace was Namalvar. Right? And so therefore, Sri Vaishnavism cannot be spoken of, Sri Ramanuja cannot be spoken of without speaking first of the Alvars. The Alvars were 12 in number. Alvar means immersed in God. So it is a title, it's not a name. Okay. So often in India at that time, actually in the whole world, it wasn't just in India, in all cultures, people's names were a reflection of either their qualities or their work or their family's work. Right? So you would often have names that denote a particular skill or a particular function that somebody does. Okay? So the same is true in the Vedic culture. As I just told you, Rama Mishra. Mishra is a title about something that he did later on in his life. So previously he had a different name. And then he took on Rama Mishra because of what he achieved in life, what he did in life. So this idea of names and titles changing and evolving was very common. So similarly, when we speak about the Alvars, this is a title that is attributed to them, not at birth, but post-birth. Once they are recognized for the beings that they are, then they are sort of uh, referred to as Alvars after the fact. 
not during. Yeah. So they were Vaishnava poets and saints. They didn't teach philosophy in the traditional sense. They hinted at philosophy with their devotion. So they compiled hymns, poems, we call them, as I said, Pashurams. Okay. And in those those poetic descriptions of the Lord and the Lord's relationship with us, philosophy was sprinkled. Because as they defined the Lord and the relationship with the Lord, naturally that defines our understanding of the Lord's nature, our nature, and the way we relate. That is philosophy. Philosophy is an attempt to explain the world around us, right? And when we have philosophy existing in a religious context, it is not only trying to explain the relationship that we have towards the world around us, it is also trying to explain the relationship that the world around us has towards God. God cannot be excluded from that explanation. So therefore, if a poet speaks of a soul's love for God and the way God reciprocates with that soul, however he maps that out, however he explains that, Naturally, it is a philosophical claim because in the explanation, no matter how amorous it is, no matter how poetic it is, if there is an explanatory dimension to it, it is philosophical. You, you understand my point? Every poet is a philosopher in some sense. Yeah? If there is an explanatory dimension to the poetry. Yeah? If it reveals some observable truth about reality, be it sort of a, a, a gross truth or even a subtle truth, a meta truth of sorts, something that isn't physical but rather emotional, that is still true, then that is philosophy also. So the, the Alvars were primarily poets and devotees and as a byproduct of that, they were philosophers. Yeah? And there are two different schools of thought about when they did all of this. And they are very, very different. Yeah. There is the academic and there is the traditional. If you ask Sri Vaishnavas in South India, when did the Alvars live? They will tell you, the first of them lived in the Treta Yuga. Before Kali Yuga even came. Whereas the last of them came just before Ramanuja. So someone like Kulashekara Alvar composer of Mukunda Mala Stotram, they would say he was more recent. Fifth, sixth century, seventh maybe, right? But the range is vast from the first to the last in traditional belief. Obviously, there is no proof for this other than verbal testimony, okay? Which is why the academic opinion consensus is different because they seek to have some kind of evidence, right? Either in writings or something and they date these texts and so therefore they say, they conclude that the entire body of 12 Alvars lived between the 5th and 10th century, actually. So which one is true, honestly, is a bit irrelevant. Because our point is not to study the historical development of these ideas, but rather what these ideas produced, the effect of these ideas. And this is always the better way to judge something. It's, if you want to know the quality of a tree, you taste the fruit. Right. There are exceptions to this, but for the most part, I would say that is a, a healthier way to look at things. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. So, they, in some sense, revived the Bhakti movement. Now, you may ask, why did it need reviving? Because everything comes and goes. This is the way of this world. It will need reviving again. It will always need reviving. Reviving doesn't mean that it dies, but it becomes less prominent. So it fluctuates from prominence to non-prominence, but it doesn't mean that it dies. The truth can never die. And so when we hear in the Bhagavatam that dharma is depicted as a uh, cow with four legs, and each of these legs represents a different virtue, a different pillar of dharma, and in each of the four yugas, as it goes cyclically, with the passing of one yuga to another, it is said that that cow loses one of its legs. So one of the pillars of Dharma disappears. But the one pillar that it remains standing upon during the Kali Yuga is truth. So the one pillar that never disappears is truth. 
And so then as we go back towards the Satya Yuga, once again, it has all four pillars, right? So no matter how degraded society becomes, and it will become more degraded, don't doubt it for one second, truth never disappears in its entirety, which is very important for us to understand because it means that for those who sincerely seek, the truth can always be found. And that is why it always remains. All things can be lost except the truth because through the truth, all things can be reestablished. You understand? Everything that is good can be lost. Everything that is of purpose can be lost except truth because it is by truth that those things can be reestablished. And therefore the cycle exists. Yeah? It's a, an interesting point that we can elaborate in other times. So they had a very important, interesting, let's say, philosophical outlook in the world. The Alvars saw Narayana as the indweller of every other deity. And this was their way of reconciling Vedic culture with Vaishnavism. Because Vaishnavism is, ex is exclusive. It sees Narayana as the only worshipable deity. And everything else is measured in relationship with Narayana. And so that can be problematic for the broad-minded Vedic conception of, of reality. And it has at different times historically, and it will continue to do, breed conflict. Because for the immature mind, they will say, I worship Vishnu. Other deities are inferior. And then someone will say, well, I worship Shiva. Other deities are inferior. And then we'll fight, right? And this is fine. It is of the human nature, again, to create these divisions and conflicts. But everyone has to, if they have virtue and values, attempt to reconcile these visions because we don't want conflict. And so the, the, there are different approaches to reconciling these visions. The Advaitins would say, actually, they are one. There is no difference. Whereas the Alvars, not being Advaitins, say they are one because one dwells within the other. And so to speak of them as being conflictuous or separate is just foolishness, right? And so the way that they or organized this, the, the Alvars, they said that the other deities, they have Narayana dwelling within them. And so there is no need for any animosity towards these deities. Rather, they also are worshipable, but they are worshipable for the essence that resides within them. And the same applies to all human beings. Human beings are worthy of respect and worship because of what lies within them not because of what lies external to that essence. And so when you create that vision, that Sama Darshanam, which Krishna speaks of in the Gita, it is a way of creating Sama Darshana. Sama Darshana means equal vision. So you can arrive at equal vision because you literally think everything is the same. But to do that, you will have to deny every experience that you have. It's a bit problematic. Look around you. Do you see everything as being the same? No. And so to adopt such a philosophy, it requires you to negate that which you have accepted as being true, which is the difference and distinction of everything that you perceive. And if you say this is not real, my perception is false, then how can you therefore have any real perception in your life and therefore build any foundation of reality if you reject the very foundation of perception? Perception is by by, let's say, its nature faulty, therefore anything that I perceive through the means of perception must also be faulty. Therefore, how can you achieve truth? You cannot. So rather, instead of doing that, let's accept that what we see is accurate, but incomplete, right? What I'm seeing is true, this is an important distinction, but incomplete is different than saying what I'm seeing is false. Do you understand that difference, okay? So, the Vaishnava takes the position that what I am seeing is true but incomplete until I elevate my perception. So really, our problem is just a problem of perception. God is here right now. I just don't perceive him. Vaikuntha is here right now. I just don't perceive it. So the issue is only an issue of perception. I must increase my perceptive capacity and then I see. It is not that there is some fault in this. It is only a fault in perception. And that is how you reconcile all things. And that is a foundational point, actually, of the Haribhakta Sampradaya Siddhanta also, but not today's topic. Yeah. I am taking the time to explain this because you have to understand the mindset, the foundational thinking of Ramanuja's life. 
because Ramanuja is 100% inspired by the Alvars. So Ramanuja's mission, if you want to call it that, was reconciling the theism of the Alvars with conventional Vedanta of his time, which means Shankara's Vedanta. He was trying to join the discipline of, the, of Vedanta as seen by, by Shankara and his followers with the vision of the Alvars. And so Shankara will say the world is false. The Alvars will say the world is real. How do you reconcile these things? By doing exactly what I just said. By saying that this is real but incomplete. Then you give some credibility to the notion of falseness but without calling it unreal. Because if you call it unreal, then everything that you interact, perceive and are is of no value. And that cannot be the basis of life. Right? Right? There's always an inner struggle inside of me, not Ramanuja, uh, of how far to go with these things because always there's a cost of time. We move on. So, I've presented you Parampara, Alvars, the works of the Alvars, Divya Prabandham. So the Divya Prabandham, Divya means light. Prabandham means a treaty. A treaty means what? Like a, a doctrine. Okay? So the doctrine of light, the luminous doctrine, the luminous, let's say, uh, Siddhanta, you can almost call it also. Yeah? So Prabandham and Siddhanta actually have some, some commonality. Not exactly the same, but similar. Yeah? So there are 4,000 verses compiled in Tamil that were spoken, written by the 12 Alvars. Now, they are referred to as the Tamil Veda because Veda is that which reveals knowledge. And it, has a, it, is, it is uncreated, it is revealed. That is the notion of, Veda, of the Veda. So, so similarly, they, they see the Divya Prabandham as revealing truth about Bhagavan and his relationship to us, not creating truth. It is not some fabrication. It is not philosophy made by someone. It is revealing the actual nature of God by those who know him intimately, the Alvars, immersed in God, right? So therefore, it is seen by the followers of the Alvars as the Tamil Veda. It is of the same standard as the Veda. And therefore, the Alvars and those who follow the Alvars are known as the Ubhaya Vedanti. Ubhaya means um, both. So the one who... Those who follow both Vedas. The Sanskrit Veda, as we all know it, and the Tamil Veda, which is called the Divya Prabandham. Okay? So, the content of these 4,000 verses, as I said earlier, it's devotional praise of Srimad Narayan in his many forms. So often, the Alvars, when they compiled this, they would put themselves in the position of famous bhaktas, or of personalities who would have been around at the time of the various incarnations of the Lord. So, for example, Nam Alvar speaks from the perspective of Yashoda. Nam Alvar speaks from the perspective of the gopis. Andal speaks from this perspective also. So you see often, they who know Bhagavan will speak, what was it actually like? What would it be like to interact with the Lord as a mother? to interact with the Lord as a lover, to interact with the Lord as a friend, etc., etc. And so they reveal the psychology of bhava. So bhava is spiritual emotion. So everything that is material has a spiritual equivalent. We have a body, we also have a spiritual body. We have a mind, there is also a spiritual mind. We have an ego, which is identity. We call it false. There is a real one, which is spiritual. So there is equivalence, correspondence, let's put it like this. So there is also correspondence on the level of experience. So what, they, what, what we call emotion on a spiritual platform is called bhava. Yeah? So the bhav of one who loves the Lord as a mother or as a friend or as a lover or whatever it may be, is explained in the Divya Prabandham. So it gives a variety of... of let's say, pathways by which one can engage with God in a meaningful way, in a true way. And, and so this revelatory nature of the Divya Prabandham is why it is given this authority of Veda. This is Veda because it actually maps out 
the highest truth, which is a relationship between Atma and Paramatma. Yeah. Now moving on, Alvars Divya Prabandham, Divya Deshams. So Divya Desha means, Divya again, light Desha means place, location. So there are sacred locations to the Sri Vaishnava tradition, and they are the places where the Alvars spoke their Pashurams. Because they were poems, but they didn't just recite their poems, they sung their poems. And so the Alvars traveled to different holy places and they would sing these devotional poems. And so these places, so if the Divya Prabandham are the, the conclusions of light, the luminous conclusions of the enlightened beings, then the places where they are spoken become the enlightened places. Yeah, the luminous places on earth. And so they are called Divya Deshams. There are 108 Vishnu temples that are mentioned in the works of the Alvars. So how do we know them? Because when the Alvars sung them, they said where they were singing them. So they said, here I am in temple so and so, and here I praise the glories of Lord Krishna, of Lord Narayana, etc. Yeah. So these are 108 temples in South India, not all in South India. So 105 of them are in India, dispersed, but mainly in the South. One is in Nepal, Muktinath. One is in the Milky Ocean, if you ever want to go visit Mahavishnu. And one is Vaikuntha. Okay? So those two, if you want to visit, unfortunately you'll have to leave this body. But your other body, as I said, your corresponding body beyond the material plane can go. And there you can also see what they saw. And again, what did I say? This is only a problem of perception. So you don't even need to leave this body. You need to leave this perception of this body. So when you transcend the perception of this body to the perception of your soul, consciousness is unrestricted as long as the Lord permits it to travel. If you have the relationship with the Lord, you can see the Milky Ocean right here. You can see Vaikuntha here. So you can visit those temples being in this body. But you must leave the perception of this body. Do we know which Alvars? Yes, yes. yes. So as I said, in the works of the Alvars, they always say where they are. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to say it. And the question was which Alvar spoke in those. And I, I, have a, I am relatively confident with my answer, but I'm not 100% confident. And so I would rather not say something false. So I will double check and I'll get back to you. Okay. Divya Deshams, okay? So we've had Parampara, the Alvars. Divya Prabandham is the works they produce. Divya Desham is where they produced those works in a sense. This forms the foundation of Sri Vaishnavism. You now can go to India and you'll visit many of these Divya Deshams. Many of them, unfortunately, are not in the best condition. With time, things degrade. And if you don't look after them, well, what can you expect? But this is the, the foundation of the reality in which Ramanuja was being born. Okay, he was born into this landscape. Divya Deshams established, Divya Prabandham known and taught. Okay, and then he comes. So let's begin with his life. Yes. Yeah. No. So the question is uh, are the Milky Ocean and Vaikuntha one and the same? To Sri Vaishnavas, yes. Well, to some Sri Vaishnavas, yes. To other Sri Vaishnavas, no. To Gaudiya Vaishnavas, 100% no. To Haribhakta Sampradaya Vaishnavas, 100% no. They are not the same. So the Milky Ocean is sometimes called the causal ocean. So that which gives rise to all effects. The material world is seen as an effect that originates from a prior cause. The cause being Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu, as the originator of all material effects, 
is not in Vaikuntha. Because in Vaikuntha, no matter is ever manifest. So Vaikuntha contains the potentiality for all matter because Narayana in his fullness is there. But material nature is unmanifest in Vaikuntha and manifest out of Vaikuntha. This is the idea. And so it, it manifests out of the causal ocean. But the causal ocean must by definition exist outside of the borders of Vaikuntha. So therefore, in the Vyuha process, Narayana emanates as, as um, what we would term as Mahavishnu. And that Mahavishnu gives rise to all material creations. And, he, and that Mahavishnu is residing on that causal ocean. Okay? Similarly, when you then visit the Vishnu of each universe, he will be residing on a milky ocean. Okay? So this, the place of residence of Vishnu is the milky ocean. The place of residence of Narayana is Vaikuntha. Because we make a distinction in our philosophy. Okay? So the life of Sri Ramanuja. So he was born in 1017 AD. Okay, in the 11th century in Bhutapuri. So Bhutapuri no longer exists. Bhutapuri's name was changed. Now if you will go to South India, you will go to Sri Perumbudur. So in Sri Perumbudur is the birthplace of Ramanuja Acharya. You can go and visit. They have a temple dedicated to him there. Okay. And he was named Ilaya Perumal. So he, Ramanuja is not his birth name. That is the name he was given when he took sannyas initiation. And I'll explain why later. So he... His first guru actually was his father. Asuri Keshava was his name. And so he was learning from him. And his father was um, a Pancharatrik. So he was following Pancharatra Agama. Right? And so he learned from him. And then he got married at the age of 16, as was customary in that time. But soon after the wedding, his father died. And so he, would be, he became, let's say, the the primary breadwinner for the home. And so he had his mother to look after as well as his wife. But as he had lost his father, he had essentially lost his guru. Yeah? So he needed to seek education elsewhere. And after the death of his father, he left Shiperum Budur because it was no longer financially sustainable. He needed to go somewhere where he could make more money to look after his, his family. And so they moved to Kanchi. So Kanchi was a bigger city than Shiperum Budur at the time. And so in Kanchi, he continued, um, he wanted to continue his education, okay? So when he goes to, to Kanchi, he seeks out the prominent teacher in Kanchi in order to continue. And the, the teacher at the time that was most prominent was Yadav Prakash. Now Yadav Prakash, he had been a follower of the school of Advaita Vedanta of Shankaracharya, but actually he had disagreed with some of the conclusions of Shankaracharya. And it was his, con his uh, let's say, um, conviction that he was going to improve upon the works of Shankaracharya. And so he made his own school and he became quite prominent. But Yadav Prakash was quite famous for being not only a Vedantin, an Advaitic Vedantin, but also he was very well versed in the sciences of ritual, but also of what they will term as magic. Right? So what we mean by that is he worked very much in a tantric sense yeah, to create, let's say, um, desirable outcomes by the manipulation of material energy. Okay? So he was well versed in these practices also. And so, as you know in this world, these things impress people. So it is very easy to become prominent if you join your philosophy with some practical demonstration of these magic Tricks, if you want to call it this, yeah? Powers, whatever you want to call. And so like that, he gains prominence. And so Yadav Prakash became the prominent teacher of Kanchi. And so Ramanuja went to him to take education from Yadav Prakash. And he did so sincerely. Yeah? So as he was learning and serving him, so he was serving him also personally, he often found himself disagreeing with Yadav Prakash's conclusions. So Yadav Prakash would explain the, ma the major precepts of Vedanta and Ramanuja would see things slightly differently. And so sometimes they would argue and gradually, you see Yadav Prakash was somebody with a big ego. As I just said, he disagreed with Shankar and was trying to make his own thing. So obviously you can imagine how he would respond to a 16-year-old telling him he's wrong. 
and correcting him. Yeah. So he didn't like Ramanuja's uh, behavior in classes, but Ramanuja didn't mean to offend him at all. And so he would always make it up to him by serving him. He would press his feet. He would massage him. He would do things to show his genuine subservience to Yadav Prakash. He was genuinely trying to learn, but he just had a different understanding of things. And so that escalated more and more until there was finally a moment where himself and two other students, also his cousin, by the way, his cousin was called Govindan. He was also studying under Yadav Prakash, Ramanuja's cousin from his mother's side. Came one day, so after class, they were um, tending to Yadav Prakash. So one of the disciples was massaging his legs, and one was pressing his shoulders, and one was um, putting oil in his hair, in his, in massaging his head. And as he was lying there, Yadav Prakash recited a verse which describes the eyes of Lord Vishnu. And the way he he broke down the word, the, the descriptive word, the adjective used to describe the, the eyes of the Lord. He broke the Sanskrit down into two words which mean monkey, kapi, and asan. So asan meaning seat. So the seat of a monkey, which means the buttocks of a monkey, right? And so the buttocks of a monkey is red. Yeah. And so he said, so the Lord's eyes resemble the buttocks of a monkey. Okay. And he meant it more symbolically. It's not that this, obviously this is what it is. The, the Lord has eyes of a monkey's bottom. No. But it was the analogy he used to describe the eyes of Lord Vishnu. And Ramanuja could not bear to hear this because he was a devotee. And he was like, how can you do that? Like, how can, that is the wrong interpretation. That is not how the word breaks down. And so he tried to restrain himself because he had seen how angry Yadav Prakash had been getting with him. And one of his fellow uh, god brothers, he, was, he, he saw Ramanuja about to say something and he told him sort of, you know, restrain yourself. Like, because he was already on the edge and there was this constant fear that Ramanuja was going to be sent out of the school. Yeah. But his, his emotions betrayed him. So what happened was Ramanuja started to cry and one of his tears fell on Yadav Prakash. And so he felt it. And so then he looked and said, why are you crying? And so he said, because you called the eyes of the Lord a monkey's bottom. This is not how the word breaks down. And so he broke down the word differently. And, and to display that actually another interpretation, another translation of it could be that which blossoms by receiving the radiance of the sun. And so he said, that is therefore an inference to a lotus. So a lotus is on a body of water and it blossoms by receiving light from the sun. Right, And so he said, it's not that the Kapiyasam speaks of the lotus, but it infers the lotus. And so he says, so the eyes of the Lord are like a lotus. Right, And then the disciples were very impressed by this. They liked it, but they also didn't say anything because they know that their guru did not like it. And so at that point, Yadav Prakash realized something. He not only got angry, as he usually got, but this time he realized he was wrong. And that realization he didn't have previously. So previously when Ramanuja was correcting him in class, Yadav Prakash still thought he was right and Ramanuja was wrong. But when Ramanuja spoke this interpretation, Yadav Prakash accepted it, but not outwardly. Yeah, inwardly he realized, I have a problem here. Because my problem is I want to make a school that rivals Shankara because I believe I have a better philosophy. But now my own student is able to explain things better than me. But differently to me. I cannot therefore achieve my goals if Ramanuja continues to become more and more prominent. So he literally decides to kill Ramanuja. Okay. But he wants to do it in the most sattvic way possible. Okay, because he's a spiritual man. So he wants to kill him, but kill him nicely. So he proposes a pilgrimage to Kashi to Varanasi, for him and his students. And it would be a months-long trip from South India to the north, and they would go to the Ganges. And so what they were going to do is, on the way, he, was, he made a plot that Ramanuja would be drowned in the Ganges. So as they were crossing, he would not give him the adequate help, so to speak, and then he would drown. But it's the Ganges, so it would purify Ramanuja, so Ramanuja would go to heaven, and then they would take their bath in the Ganges at Varanasi 
to wash away their sins. So Ramanuja would go up, they would have no sins, master plan. You see, very intelligent. The problem was, as I told you, Ramanuja's cousin was also a student of Yadav Prakash. So Yadav Prakash had to tell his students of the plan. At first, the students didn't like it. But then he, with his logic, his twisted logic that I just told you, he convinced them. And they said, okay, actually, we are servants of our guru. And if Ramanuja's existence jeopardizes our guru's glory, then we have to serve our guru. So they accepted the logic. But it leaked to Govindan. So Govindan heard this from one of the other students. And so he wanted to warn Ramanuja, look, this is what they're going to do. But he was being watched because they realized that he found out. So he was waiting for a moment that he could inform Ramanuja. So off they go on this pilgrimage. And then one night, as they were walking, they were in a forest, they went to sleep in one particular area. And as they were sleeping, they always made sure to keep Govindan and Ramanuja apart so that Govindan would not tell Ramanuja. But in the middle of the night, when they were all sleeping, Govinda woke up and he went to Ramanuja. And he woke him up, he said, come with me, I need to tell you something. And so then he tells Ramanuja, they are plotting to kill you. You need to leave now. And he says, well, what will happen to you? I will make up some story. I will say that some tiger came and took you or something. But, or a boar, I think it was a boar, he said. But I have to warn you. And so Ramanuja sort of begrudgingly, but he accepts and he goes into the forest, he leaves, right? So then they wake up and they realize, where is Ramanuja? So they immediately suspect Govindan. They go to Govindan and say, what happened to him? And Govindan says, actually, I woke up in the night because there was a loud noise. A wild boar came and I saw the wild boar chasing Ramanuja away into the forest, but I was too scared to get up and do anything. And so Yadav Prakash said, wow, look at my luck. I didn't even have to do anything. Divine Providence took care of Ramanuja. The boar killed him. So I didn't have to get my hands dirty. So he was very happy. So him and his disciples, they just accepted that statement and they moved on in their pilgrimage to Varanasi. But meanwhile, Ramanuja was in the forest. So he was alone. And so he was walking, trying to find some civilization. And his feet were tired and wounded. And eventually, as he lies under a tree to take some rest... When he wakes up, there's a couple, a hunter and his wife are walking towards him. And so he speaks to the hunter and the wife and he says, oh, could you please help me? But he sees in them that they are not normal. They have this effulgence like this. The hunter, he's wearing like animal skin as, as clothes, but he has such a beauty to him, such an effulgence. He finds it abnormal and he feels compelled to address him as like my lord or sir which would not be normal for a Brahmin as Ramanuja to do to a hunter. And his wife had this golden effulgence also where he felt like she was his mother. Anyway, he asks them, look, I am lost here in the forest. I need some help, please. Could you please guide me to some shelter? And they said, yes, no problem. We know the forest very well. well whatever you ask, we'll do it. And so they started walking. And they walked and they walked and they walked. They spent a night in the forest. They kept on walking. And then at some point they asked him, can you please bring us some water? We're very thirsty. And so Ramanuja, he was instructed where he could go. There was a well over there. You go to that well. So he went to the well and he would, he said, but I have nothing to bring. Just bring it in your hand. So Ramanuja would bring the water. They would drink. And as they would drink, he would feel such joy, such happiness. And three times they asked him to do this. And he had no problem. Back and forth, he went bringing water from this well. And they were drinking, drinking, drinking. And then they said, sorry, but we're going to have to ask you a fourth time. And so he went. And as he turned around, they were gone. And when he got to the well, he met some... was this normal man. And he says to him, oh, excuse me, can you tell me, I'm trying to find Kanchi. This Ramanuja lived in Kanchi. Where is the, the right way? And the man looks at him, you are a fool or what? You are in Kanchi. And he says, what do you mean? He says, go, we walk over there. So he, from, he, he walked some more into the direction that the man had pointed him and then he saw right there was the city of Kanchi. And he says, how is this possible? I was in a forest far away. And so he realized that the two people who had guided him were 
Lakshmi Narayana. Yeah. And they had taken him from a forest far away and transported him back to his house, to Kanchi. And that well, he then always took water from that well to serve the deity of Lord Varadaraj in Kanchi, Lord Narayana. But that's another story for another time. Right. So that well become, became very famous also. Yeah. But he was so touched by this because he thought, Lord, you could have sent anyone. Vishvakshena would have been too much. Yeah? But you came yourself. Ma, you came yourself. Instead of sending some Vishnu Dutas to help me, you both came yourselves. And he was so touched by this. Right? So his resolve to be even more of a devotee of theirs just carried on growing and growing and growing. So this we have to see. This is the first pause I will make in his story, a life story, so that we understand the the example here because it's very relevant for us god can send any one of his billions of saints he has many don't worry after many yugas there are many saints produced to help the fallen souls or the souls that are yet to have that perception of the divine but sometimes god comes himself and when he comes himself there has to be an adequate recognition of that that he didn't have to and yet he does and he could have mapped a very different road for you. And yet he comes himself and takes your hand as they took, as he took the hand of Ramanuja. He could have sent anyone to just simply take Ramanuja out of the forest and he would have still been far away and then he has to make his own way back to Kanchi. But this is the nature of God. He himself comes and he makes a disproportionate help. He took him straight back to Kanchi. And so we have to have this recognition and from that recognition will be born gratitude. Nothing else can be born. And when you have gratitude, the, t the likelihood that you will receive the next help is a hundred times greater than if you don't have that gratitude. And you know this from your own human interactions. When you help somebody and they're grateful, your desire to help them increases. When you help somebody and they're ungrateful, your desire to help them diminishes. Isn't it? Now, this is a conditional way of thinking. God is not conditional, so he will always help, but we are conditional. And so, a way to our unconditioned state is through gratitude. The more we become accepting and, and, and grateful for that which comes into our life, the more we start to remove the conditions for our life. So Ramanuja gave the first example there, or rather the Lord in, in helping Ramanuja. Now the Lord, I believe, has also come to help us in our lives. And so similarly, we have to recognize this and produce the consequent gratitude. From that, everything else can flow. But if we fail to recognize it and we complain, which is the symptom of ungratefulness, then don't be surprised if the flow doesn't happen. Okay, so. Like that, he evades the assassination plot. Now imagine, some time after, what happens? Yadav Prakash and his students return from Varanasi. And who do they find in Kanchi? Ramanuja. So he's shocked. But he can't be too shocked. Because he doesn't want to reveal that he tried to kill him. He doesn't know that Ramanuja knows. Right? And so he sees that Ramanuja not only is back, but he is continuing to study under him. So Ramanuja went back to Yadav Prakash's school. So just see the humility of Ramanuja. So even though he was, the, Yadav Prakash was plotting to kill him, he said, no, I'll give him another chance. I must say, on that level, I would not have done the same. But, you know, that's why he's Ramanuja and I'm not. <laughs> um, so he continues to study under him. The king of Kanchi, he had a daughter, and his daughter was possessed by a, a Brahma Rakshasa. So it means the ghost of a departed Brahmin. So a Brahmin who died in an impure state or who died in a traumatic way. And so sometimes the ghost remains. And the ghost had taken hold of the princess. And so the king was desperate to have someone exorcise his daughter. And so he thought, well, Yadav Prakash is famous for his tantric skills you know, with magic and all of this. And so for sure, he is the right person to call. And so he called Yadav Prakash to come and um, 
heal his daughter. And so Yadav Prakash attempted to do it, but he failed. He failed miserably. The, the ghost inside the body of um, the princess laughed at him. He was just laughing. And you cannot get rid of me. And then what happened was that one of the associates of the king said, well, actually, Yadav Prakash has a disciple who is very special. He's a very effulgent being. Maybe you try with him. And as he said this, the ghost himself said, I will only depart because the ghost wanted to depart. It's not that he wanted to possess the princess. He wanted to move on. So he said, I will only depart if, if Ramanuja comes and places his feet on my head. And so the king was surprised. Who is this boy? Who is this person that the ghost is calling for? And Yadav Prakash was very surprised or not surprised, rather worried. And so Ramanuja came and Ramanuja accepted. He knew what needed to be done. So he put his foot on the head of the princess and the ghost left and she was fine. And so, of course, if the king recognizes his greatness, then that starts to spread. And so Yadav Prakash, he kicked him out of his school. So his jealousy was too much. And so at that point, he said, now you are out. Yeah, he could not accept his superiority, and so he rejected him, and so he kicked him out. He didn't, didn't want him as a student anymore. And so what happened? Ramanuja again sought another guru. I want to continue my studies. So he accepted Kanchipurna. So Kanchipurna was the pujari, not a pujari rather, he was actually sweeping in the temple of Lord Varadaraj. So Lord Varadaraj is Narayana in Kanchi. So Kanchi has a temple, and the main deity there is a smiling Narayana. So he, he, you can see to this day, it's one of the most beautiful deities you will, you will ever see. You can Google Lord Varadaraj. You can't take photos, so actually it's not so easy to find pictures. You Google, he has a smiling face. Yeah. So this deity of Narayana, a very special deity, was being uh, served by Kanchipurna. Kanchipurna was sweeping, because Kanchipurna was a Shudra. He was not a Brahmin. Yeah. But he had a gift. He could speak to the deity, and the deity would speak back to him. And the, the Pujaris, they recognized him. So even though he was a Shudra, he was very well respected. Nobody ever prohibited him from doing anything, because they knew he had a special relationship with, with the Lord, but he preferred to sweep. Yeah? So it wasn't that he was prohibited from doing other things, but he wanted to do that. This morning in the temple, I gave satsang about that. So he was sweeping by choice. But when he met Ramanuja, so Ramanuja said, I want to take you as my guru because you speak to Lord Varadaraj. And I am a devotee of Lord Varadaraj. So I live in Kanchi. Ka Lord Varadaraj is the, the Lord of Kanchi. So therefore, I want to be your disciple. And Kanchi Purna accepted, but he said, I will intercede for you. Which means I will speak to Lord Varadaraj on your behalf. I, don't, I will not be your guru, but I will be your messenger. So actually, he spoke to Lord Varadaraj. And Lord Varadaraj said, you transmit these teachings to Ramanuja. So in a sense, Lord Varadaraj was Ramanuja's guru. And so there's a famous conversation that is had where the Lord speaks to Kanchipurna and gives him six teachings six messages to give to Ramanuja. And so he gives these messages to Ramanuja. Now they're, they're quite philosophical, but amongst them, for example, is a prophecy. He says, you shall accept sannyas. You should take diksha, take initiation from one known as Mahapurna. But Mahapurna is also a title, great being. So he did not know who it would be. You could interpret it as you will take diksha from a great being. Right? But later on in life, he actually takes initiation from Mahapurna, right? person named Mahapurna. So that is one of the things that he receives from Vardaraj Swami. The other one, Vardaraj Swami says beautifully, he says, you have heard that at the time of death, you must think of the Lord. Yeah? And then you go to him. He says, that is not true. If you have surrendered, you will come anyway, no matter what you think. Right? So Lord Vardaraj is saying, he, Lord Vardaraj said that there is a difference between all the living entities. So he explained to him some philosophy also. He explained to him the Vashishta of Advaita, that there is not oneness, but rather distinction in the oneness. So some seeds were planted in Ramanuja from Bhagavan himself. 
So again, remember in the beginning when I told you that the Sampradaya model is that Lakshmi gives to Vishvakshena and so on and so forth, but I don't believe that to be a transmission of philosophy, but rather of grace. You see it even more now because Ramanuja did not get his philosophy from that chain. He got grace from that chain, that disciplic chain. He got his philosophy from Lord Vardaraj himself. Bhagavan gave him Tattva Darshana, gave him the vision of reality. He spoke the words himself, so he got his teaching from, from God, not from some disciplic succession. Yeah? So Parampara doesn't always work in that simple lineal way. Yeah? There's often things coming in from the side. Okay, so anyway, this is also not a lecture on the teachings of Vardaraj to Ramanuja. That's another class I can do. So then, as he was progressing, he receives a call from Yamunacharya. Because Yamunacharya, he had heard of Ramanuja, but he had heard that Ramanuja was studying under Yadav Prakash. And so he didn't do anything. But the minute he knew he had been expelled from the school of Yadav Prakash, Yamunacharya called for Ramanuja to come because he wanted Ramanuja to be his successor. Because Yamunacharya was sick and old. But he was a very great Vaishnava. But as soon as Ramanuja heard the call, he said, of course, I will come. And so he went to Sri Rangam. So Sri Rangam is quite far from Kanchi. So Sri Rangam is further south from Kanchi. Okay? And so Kanchi is nearer to Chennai. Yeah? So as he was going down to Sri Rangam, before he reached Sri Rangam, Sri Yamunacharya died. Okay? So he was not able to speak with him. They never met in person. They never spoke. Yeah. So as he reaches Yamunacharya's uh, body, he finds that actually one hand is like this, right, in Jnana Mudra, and the other hand is clenched. And so he says, that is strange. And so what happens is that he realizes three fingers should be extended also on this hand, but they're not. So he must want me to promise him three things. So I will make three commitments to him. This was Ramanuja's perception, his realization of the moment. And so he does so. So Ramanuja makes three vows to the body of Yamunacharya. The first vow to free the people from illusion and spread the glories of the Lord. So this illusion can be interpreted in two different ways, either from ignorance or from the philosophy of illusion, mayavad, advaita, right? So this is, has been interpreted differently by different people, this vow. And as he said the first vow, the, the fist which was like this, one finger extended. So then he said the second vow, to establish that there is no truth beyond Sriman Narayana by writing the Sri Basya. So the Sri Basya, Basya means commentary. So Sri Basya, why? Because it is the exalted commentary. We use the term Sri as a term of exaltation, not only to denote Ma, but we say Sri Swami Vishwananda, for example, right? So it's a point of, uh, of exaltation. So Sri Basya, I'll make a great commentary to demonstrate that Narayana is the supreme truth, that there is no truth beyond Narayana. Because the Advaita of Shankara acknowledged Narayana. Yes, Narayana is a reality. Narayana exists. But there is a reality beyond Narayana, which is Brahman, impersonal. So he said, no, I will show that Sriman Narayana, the person, is the supreme reality of which there is no higher reality. And he will do so by commenting on the Brahma Sutras. So the Brahma Sutras are the summary of the Upanishads, which is the philosophical portion of the Vedas, as compiled by Badarayana Rishi, otherwise known as Veda Vyasa. So Veda Vyasa, he makes a compilation of the Upanishads. Ramanuja says, I will comment on that compilation. I will extract truth from that compilation to show you that Narayana is the supreme truth. So he makes that second vow. And what happens? The second finger extends. And in the third, he says, to honor sage Parasara, the author of the Vishnu Puran, so the father of Veda Vyas, who is the author of Bhagavad Puran, Srimad Bhagavatam, I will name one very qualified Vaishnava after him. So Parashara, he would name some devotee with that 
name, to continue the legacy, to honor those that have given the Vaishnavas the foundation for their belief, for their faith. Without Vishnu Purana, without Parashara's son, Vedavyasa, and consequently the Bhagavata Purana, how will we know the pastimes of the Lord? We would not know. Because the Bhagavad Gita is the teaching of the Lord, but it does not have his pastimes. Even the Mahabharata, you may say, oh, but the Mahabharata has the pastimes. Well, who wrote the Mahabharata? Vedavyas. And where was Vedavyas born? From Parashara Muni. So you, we have to give the gratitude to Parashara Muni. Because through him, Vishnu Puran, through his son, all the other Puranas. And that is how we know our Lord. In part. Yeah? So this was his third vow. I will honor them by giving this name to a worthy Vaishnava and the third finger extended so that Yamunacharya died with Jnana Mudra on both hands. So he made these three vows. And so like that, those who were there understood informally that Yamuna wanted him as his disciple. That this was a diksha of sorts, but it was not formal. And so actually, even though this event happened, Ramanuja did not take the seat of Yamuna's successor immediately in the mutt of Shirangam. It was one year later. So, as he made these promises, Yamuna's successor actually was Tiruvar Tiruvaranga. So Tiruvaranga was the successor of Yamuna Char. He was his disciple, but he was not fit for purpose. Not because he was a bad person, but because when you have... Um, Let's say, have you ever tried, you've been in a dark room and then you light the flashlight on your phone to give some light? Have you ever, been, have you ever done that? Yeah, so how stupid does that look when someone turns on the light of the room? Yeah, it's a bit stupid. Then you just turn off your flashlight. What's the use of the little light when there's a big one? So Tiruvaranga was like the little flashlight. Very good. He brings some light also, but Ramanuja was like the light switch. He was much bigger light. So why would you not step aside and let the bigger light do the job? So he understood that and he said to him, you are much more appropriate. You are much more fitting to this task than I am. So one year later, Tiruvaranga stepped down and he allowed Ramanuja to take the position. Yeah. So then, Mahapurna, one of the disciples of Yamunacharya, is sent to Kanchipuram to initiate Ramanuja as a sannyas. So Ramanuja was in his 30s at this time. So Ramanuja, you see, in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, they did not believe too much in sannyashood. So sannyasis were not common. It was mainly grihastas. Even the acharyas were grihastas. They, they took a wife, they had children, all of this. So it was very uncommon to have renunciants, right? But Ramanuja wanted to, to be a sannyasi. He took that initiative himself. And from him onwards, it became quite common. Nowadays, again, it is not so common. But the one who sits at the head of the mutt usually is always a sannyas. Even if many temples and many branches can have um, grihasta acharyas, which still to this day goes on, even Guruji, he was initiated by a grihasta acharya into the Sri Sampradaya, right? At the, the heads of the mutts are usually always sannyasis. Okay? So Ramanuja wanted to do this. So they... To get sannyas initiation, you require another sannyas to give it to you. It doesn't matter what philosophy they follow. It matters that they are a sannyas. Because sannyas is nothing to do with philosophy. It's renunciation. So one who is renounced can give renunciation to another. Yeah? So he took sannyas from Mahapurna. It was proposed to him, what about Mahapurna? And so he said, ah, well, I have been told to take initiation by the Lord himself from Mahapurna. So... Of course, he accepted. And then he was given the name Ramanuja. So Ramanuja means, it's two words joined. It's Rama and Anuja. So Anuja means younger brother. So younger brother of Rama. So who is the younger brother of Rama? Lakshmana, one of them. So Lakshmana. And so Lakshmana, Laksha, Lakshma, Lakshmana actually means one who is very radiant who possesses many qualities. Yeah. So a lakshana is a quality, an attribute. So when we speak about one who has many great lakshanas, it's one who has many great qualities. So they said, this is, he is truly a lakshmana. 
Ramanuja. And so, but he is also such a devotee of the Lord. So he is, let's give him not the name Lakshmana, but Ramanuja. Same thing, but different. Yes. Correct me if I'm uh, wrong. Uh, is Ramanuja also means the one who follows Rama? Because you can also split the Anuja into two words. The one who follows Rama. Yes, you're not wrong. No need to correct. <clears throat> it is as, as is the case with most Sanskrit names, there are more than one interpretations. Yeah. Okay, so then... After he receives this name, he studies. See, Ramanuja also studied. He had academy. He had the academy platform. He made his login, and he went online and took some courses. So he studied. What was he studying? Brahma Sutras, Vedanta, because he had made his vow, no, that he was going to give the commentary. So he was studying that. But always, as I said in the beginning, with a view to reconcile that to the Divya Prabandham. So always in a comparative sense, to reconcile. Yeah, never just one, always together. And that's actually how we study Guruji also. So another pause here. When we study, we can make two mistakes. We can study Shastra and philosophy independent from Guruji. We can listen to Guruji independent from Shastra and philosophy. Both are mistakes. Because Guruji, if you listen to him, automatically you will study Shastra and philosophy because he tells you to. And if you truly follow Shastra, they will tell you to follow your Guru. Because the Guru has something that Shastra doesn't have. He has the ability to personally customize the Tattva Darshana to you. Because in Bhagavad Gita chapter 4 verse 34, Krishna says that the reason you follow a guru is because he has had tattva darshana. He has seen the truth. Those who have seen the truth can instruct you into that same truth. But seen means pratyaksha. It means direct perception. So scriptures speak of, of the divine truth accurately. I am not contesting that. Shastra reveals the divine truth. Yes. Guru who has tattva darshana also reveals the divine truth. But the guru can speak, the shastra cannot. So when you have a question, when you have a, a custom situation that you find yourself in, the one who has tattva darshina can apply that to your reality and explain within context. And context is king. Context always matters. And how many problems we have seen in the religious spiritual world because of lack of context. Because people don't know how to contextualize things and therefore they twist and reach wrong conclusions. So the living Tattva Darshana is very important to go alongside the written testimony of Tattva Darshana, right? Why, if you then say Tattva Darshana living is so much better, why then should we follow Shastra and study philosophy? Simple, because the living one doesn't say everything to everyone. How many of you have had extensive hours of conversation with Guruji about Tattva Darshana? You get my point. So therefore, he says, you refer to Shastra. It is there. I am agreeing with it. So the, the Gita is verified. Yeah. So you, you can have hours of conversation with the Gita. But you contextualize that conversation by the minutes of listening to Guruji. You understand? So you cannot make the mistake of one without the other. It's not complete. Complete is both. But Shastra seen through the lens of the, the living Tattva Darshana because he will give the contextualization and then you follow. Don't try to understand the Guru through the lens of Shastra. Understand Shastra through the lens of the Guru. Okay? Good. So then, he receives the post of Acharya, so Acharya being the head, and the other of Prakash's mother, God bless the lady, she goes to the temple of Lord Varadaraj and she sees Ramanuja walk in. So she goes to pay her respects to Lord Varadaraj. Ramanuja walks in, she looks at him and says, wow, who is that? Because he had such an effulgent. You know when somebody walks in the room 
and their presence fills the whole room. You feel like, wow, somebody special walked in. And let's be honest, you've had that experience not only with Guruji. Sometimes you get there with other people also. Yeah, somebody fills a room. Yeah, somebody walks in, you cannot ignore them. Yeah. So she saw Ramanuja and she had this feeling, my son should become his disciple. So she goes to Yadav Prakash and says, it is my wish that you become the disciple of Ramanuja. And he says, not possible. How will I become the disciple of my own student? And the mother was very simple in her argument because I'm asking you to. So that is also philosophy. Yeah. Mother's emotional blackmail is a very deep philosophy. Yeah. Hi, mom. So then um, what happens? He, he rebels. He says no. And then he has a dream. He sleeps that night, the other Prakash. And in that dream, a saintly person comes to him and says, you should take initiation from Ramanuja. And again, he's rebelling. Then he says, I will go speak to Kanchi Purna because Kanchi Purna, he is a respected mystic. You know, he speaks to the deity. So he went and he said to him, what should I do? And Kanchi Purna said, you should take initiation from Ramanuja. And still he rebelled. But then he started to think, hey, there was that time with the princess, isn't it? I couldn't heal the princess, but Ramanuja healed her. There was that time that I tried to kill him and magically he was back in Kanchi. There was that time that, you know, this, that, and the other. And he starts to reflect on all these things. And he says, maybe I'm just a bit arrogant. <laughs> so finally, yes, he accepts. And he goes to Ramanuja and he says, I want to be your disciple. And when he goes to Ramanuja, being in his presence, he hadn't seen him for a long time. Being in his presence, he was so overcome by, by the effulgence of Ramanuja, he had, who, had he, who, who he had become, that he bows down at his feet and he says, please accept me. And Ramanuja, without a second thought, says, no problem. And he accepts him and he gives him a new name of Govindan Jiyar. So, and then he gave him a task. I want you to do a service for me. Your job is to write a manual on sannyas life. So you have to write how to be a good sannyasi, how to be a good monk. And so at, at the age of 80-something, Govinda Jiyar, ex Yadav Prakash, he made. So the book was published. You don't publish at that time, but he presented it to Ramanuja and to the deity of Vardaraj. Um, so that happened with Yadav. That's Yadav Prakash's story arc, so to speak. And still to this day, sannyasis in the Sri Vaishnava movement refer to his instructions for how to be a sannyas. And so first he wanted to kill Ramanuja. So just see. <laughs> and then they all take instruction from him now. But this is possible. This kind of conversion, this kind of change, this kind of transformation is possible. How is it possible? Not by force. It was possible by the compassion and acceptance and the insistence of Ramanuja, the forgiveness of Ramanuja. Because as I said, I would not have done what Ramanuja did. You try to kill me, we're done. I'm not going to try to kill you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an idiot. But I'm not coming back to your school. Yeah. So he was won over by the qualities of Ramanuja. Okay. So the conversion of Yadav Prakash was a big, big moment in the life of Ramanuja in Kanchi and in Shirangam, etc. Because the influence that Yadav Prakash had obviously then shifted over to Ramanuja because if, if the Guru takes initiation, naturally all his disciples come over as well, right? So this was, a, this was seen as a very pivotal moment because you have to understand, South India was predominantly Advaitin, predominantly followers of Shankara, predominantly Shaivites. Yeah. After Ramanuja left, you could not say that anymore. It was at the very least 50-50. Yeah. And you cannot underestimate how big an achievement that is when you understand the size of the population of a place like India. The number of people that you have to convert is quite big. But it's not, don't see it as conversion, see it as influence, the influence that Ramanuja had on these people, the inspiration. So, Ramanuja, he returns to Sri Rangam. He was in Kanchi for this. Remember, Yadav Prakash was in Kanchi. 
So he returns to Shirangam, where he takes where he is the Acharya, and Lord Ranganath speaks to Ramanuja. So Lord Ranganath is the deity of Shirangam. Lord Varadaraj is the deity of Kanchi. Lord Ranganath is very beautiful, big deity lying down. And so he speaks to him, and he grants Ramanuja two boons, two gifts, two powers, if you want to call it such. The first one is he gives him the power to heal the sick. So Ramanuja has that power from that moment on. And second, he gives him the boon to protect people from Maya. So remember, he had made the vow, I will protect the people from Maya. And then the Lord says, now I give you the ability to protect people from Maya. Because saying it is one thing, doing is another. So how does that boon work? It means that if Ramanuja blessed someone like with this intention, Maya would not touch them. It's like a mark. So Ramanuja puts a mark on someone and then Maya comes, uh, no, there's a mark, I cannot, go, I cannot attack this person. Yeah? Useful, no? <laughs> I said, Guruji, if, in case you're feeling a little bit you know, generous, actually I've tried so many times to get so many powers from him. And I always tell him, it's not because I want to be powerful, don't get me wrong. It's because I think people will be so impressed, they will become your devotees, right? And he's like, yeah, nice try. But I always ask for funny things. I, mean, I want to fly or I want to become invisible or something, you know. Healing people, I mean, it's nice, but it's less fun, no? You heal someone, okay, well, now you're healthy. Go get sick again, right? Like, anyway. Just see the difference of psychology. <laughs> so then he got these two boons and obviously this helped him continuing his work more and more and more and more. Yeah. Ramanuja had incredible disciples. We'll, maybe if time permits, we'll speak a little bit about them uh, towards the end. I have to move on because time is going. Actually, a secret I'll tell you. Don't take this in the wrong way because I have no clue how to do it. When I got initiated as a Swami, now, what, eight years ago, at my initiation, Guruji, um, so he gives me my danda, he's giving me the initiation, whatever, then he says, give me your hands, and I give him my hands like this, and he starts to press on my hands in different points and like whisper some mantras and doing all sorts of stuff, and then I was like, okay, what did you just do? And he says, I just gave you the power of healing, and I was like, for real? He's like, yeah. I was like, great. Okay, cool. So then I went away and I didn't tell anyone. And then like a few couple of days after, I was like, okay, so Guruji, how does this, how do we get going with this? Like, how does this healing business work? <laughs> and he said to me, you have two options. I said, okay. Option one, you figure it out by yourself. Option two, you wait for me to show you. And he looked at me as if to say, option one is for the retards, right? And I looked at him and I said, okay, I'll wait. And he said, good choice. I'm still waiting. I, <laughs> I have no clue, right? So let's just say I have some very powerful healing capacity that is very, very dormant, right? <laughs> anyway. So Mahapurna, he sends Ramanuja to, to Goshtipurna. Goshtipurna was a god-brother of Mahapurna, another disciple of Yamunacharya. Okay? And so he sends to him, he says, you should go to him. So there's two different versions. As you know, when you get initiated in the Sri Sampradaya, initiation entails pancha samskara, five steps for initiation. And one of them is mantra diksha. You get mantras, rahasatraya, three mantras. And one of them is the ashtakshara mantra, which is omna monarayanaya. And so some say that Ramanuja had already received that because he was already a Sri Vaishnava, right? So he already had Omnamona Rayanaya and what Mahapurna told him to get from Goshtipurna was the meaning of the mantra. So he had to go to Goshtipurna and ask for the meaning of Omnamona Rayanaya, okay? Another version of the story, which is the one Guruji tells, is that he didn't have the mantra and he had to go to Goshtipurna to get the mantra Om Namo Narayanaya. I just tell you both versions because you might Google stuff and find all kinds of things, okay? So, 
he lived in Tirukotio, which is a little bit further away from Kanchi. And he went to him and he was rejected. So Gostipuna said, no, I don't give you. Now, a priest in Tirukotio who was serving the deity became possessed, inspired in that moment, soon after rather. And as Goshtipurna was walking in the temple, he spoke to Goshtipurna and he said, you should bestow the mantra on my devotee. You do not understand his purity. He is able to deliver all of humanity. And even though he heard that, what did he do? He said, nope, just like Yadav Prakash. Nice dreams, nice saintly persons telling him things. And what does he do? Nope, humans are quite stubborn, in case you didn't know. So what happens? Ramanuja keeps going because he received an instruction from his initiating guru. He cannot, here's I make a pause. You cannot not do it just because it's inconvenient. Okay, he got denied. Okay, so try again. And he got denied, so try again. And he got denied, so try again. 17 times he was denied by Goshtipurna. But the principle remains. My guru gave me an instruction. I have to go to him and get the mantra. So I have to think of how to go to him, maybe change my approach, maybe change something. All of that is valid. But what I cannot give up is the point of going and getting the mantra because it's the instruction I received from my guru. So we have to have this mentality. Guruji may tell us to do things. Control your mind. Yes, Guruji. It may take you more than 17 attempts, okay? But you can't give up because the instruction remains. You can adjust the strategy, you can adjust the approach, but you cannot give up the instruction. The instruction was given, control your mind. The instruction was given, do your japa, one hour. How you do it, you can adjust, but you should not give up trying to do the one hour minimum. So this is the principle I'm trying to give across, yeah? Once the guru has given you instruction, you don't give up that instruction. You must see it. If it's now or if it's in 10 years, doesn't matter. But you cannot give it up. You have to find the way to make it happen. Yeah? Until he tells you otherwise. If he says you no longer have to do it, that's different. But if he doesn't cancel it, instruction remains. Okay. Ramanuja cries. He cries. He's questioning what great impurity he must have inside of himself to be denied this mantra. Again, where you notice the difference between me and Ramanuja. If I went to someone and they said no to me 17 times, I would say some stuff to them as well. Yeah? And maybe not so sattvic. Maybe more rajasic. Damasic is too low. I still have some standards. but So... <laughs> We have to see like that. Yeah, we have to see like that. See the persistence, but see also the humility. He doesn't question Goshtipurna. He doesn't say, Goshtipurna, you are so rude. Goshtipurna, you are like this, you are like that. You are unfair. No, he says, what have I got wrong in me that I am not yet ready or worthy to receive that mantra? So it is a self-reflection of self-improvement in order to be worthy, not you come down to my level. No, I must rise to your level. If you set the bar up here, this is what you must be to receive this, then I must meet that bar. I should not ask you to lower it to meet me where I am. Yeah? This is really important. Because it's basically, Guruji sets the standard for Vaikuntha and you say to him, Guruji, can you lower the standard please? No. You raise yours. Because he is master, we are disciple. So it's not that he must lower his standard. Because why would you ask love to lower its standard? That makes no sense then why are you pursuing love if you want love to become some cheap imitation? No, we are the cheap imitation of the Atma. This body, this consciousness, this emotion that we are able to display is the cheap imitation of our Atma's mode of expression. So we want to get to that. We don't want God to become some cheap imitation also to make it easier for us. Yeah? So that there is in this world. If you want that, this world is full of cheap imitations of God. Cheap imitations of religion, cheap imitations of spirituality, cheap imitations of love. All of that is available like a nice buffet for all of you. Yeah? But that cannot be the filter. Convenience cannot be the filter. Truth. Yeah? Reality. 
I want the real deal. I don't want the fake one. So Goshtipurna relents. He's impressed by Ramanuja's persistence. So in the 18th attempt, he says, I give you the mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya. Haribol, he celebrates. However, as we all know, Goshtipurna warns him, do not give this mantra to anyone. It is very powerful, it is very secret, etc., etc. First thing Ramanuja does, he walks near the temple in Tirukotyor, he climbs to the top of the temple, and he screams to everybody, "You, please all of you come near to Lord Vishnu's temple, I will give you a priceless jewel. And everybody comes looking for jewels. So sometimes you can also cheat. As long as the cheating is not too severe. You know, you, actually, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to do the same. So when he's preaching, he would also catch the people with some adjustment of, of words. So he knew people are interested in women. People are interested in food, fish. So fish and women, you come. There will be lots. What happens? They sing the Harinam. They sing the name of the Lord. They are nourished just like food. And then they start rolling on the ground in ecstasy. So they're having a nice time with Mother Earth. So they got food and women. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's some nice ways that you can twist things if you're intelligent for that. Okay. So the people come. Gosh, and what does the Ramanuja do? He gives the mantra to everybody. You chant with me, Om Namo Narayanai. So Goshti Purna is heading back home and he hears, Om Namo Narayanai, Om Namo Narayanai. Everybody chanting this. Right, so he freaks out. He's furious. So he says, I never want to look on the face of Ramanuja again. He was so angry. He had been deceived by Ramanuja. But the thing is this, Ramanuja knew this. And so he went to Goshtipurna and he said to him, it was only because I am prepared to suffer in hell that I dare to go against your order. You told me the mantra would liberate anyone who chanted it. Now many people have the chance to find shelter at Shimanarayan's feet. So you see, his psychology was not, look how great I am. Let me give you something great and then you can all worship me. It's, no, I will go to hell for this and that's fine. I have no problem going to hell for this as long as you all benefit. Now, he will not go to hell, but the principle stands. It's the principle of being willing to self-sacrifice where you are uninterested in yourself. You are interested in service to the Lord. And if something can liberate, why should they not have it? Yeah, so that was his mentality. So he gave it freely. Now, Goshtipurna was very impressed, thankfully, just like Yadav Prakash. So he was amazed at Ramanuja's words, so he pleads for forgiveness, but he asks his son to take initiation from Ramanuja. And he does so. Ramanuja returns to Shirangam. He commences his Shibasya commentary. Eventually, he completes Prashtantraya. I've put an asterisk next to Prashtantraya. So Prashtantraya means the three sources. It's Brahma Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, and Upanishads. So Shankaracharya, he commented on all three to give his philosophical conclusions. Actually, Ramanuja didn't comment on all three. He didn't do Prashtantraya. He only did two. His disciples finished it off. He did Sri Basya, which is Brahma Sutras, and he did Gita Basya. He did a Gita commentary. He did not do a commentary on the Upanishads because he said it was of no need, no use, because the Brahma Sutras are already the summary of the Upanishads. So technically, Ramanuja didn't do Prastantrai. He did a modified version to refute Shankara. Okay? But again, I do not sub subscribe to the idea that there is a hard and fast rule that you have to give commentary on all three. No, you have to give commentary on the subject matter. If you relate to the Gita and the Upanishads, you are giving enough relevance to the commentaries that you don't need to be methodical in all three. It's unnecessary. It's not that the Upanishads are making some statements that the Gita and the Brahma Sutras are not. Yeah? It is all one cohesive philosophical body. And so actually Ramanuja, he didn't do Prashtantrai and many after him also did not. Madhvacharya also didn't do all three by himself. Sometimes disciples afterwards fill in the gaps. But the only single Acharya who did all three was actually Shankaracharya. Yeah. After him, Acharyas have done one or two, but never the three. And then some disciples sometimes produce the remaining two or three. Okay.
Okay, so Ramanuja travels all around India. He's preaching, he's debating. Uh, there's many parts of his life I'm skipping now. Um, so Ramanuja appoints the son of Kuresha. Kuresha was one of his greatest friends and eventually disciples. There was a leela in which Kuresha went disguised as Ramanuja to a hostile king's court because he knew that the king was going to attempt to, to hurt Ramanuja. And in fact, he got blinded. So Kuresha was blinded by the king. The king thought it was Ramanuja. And then Ramanuja prayed over Kuresha to Shimanarayana. Shimanarayana restored his sight. Yeah, so there's stories that I've skipped. Yeah. So Kuresha was a great friend of Ramanuja and a disciple. So what does he do? The son of Kuresha, another name of Kuresha is uh, Kura Talvar. Ramanuja names his son Parashara Batar. Okay, so he was already Batar before and he adds Parashara like he had made in the third vow. And eventually Parashara Bhatta becomes the successor of Ramanuja. After one other, there's one other after Ramanuja and then Parashara Bhatta becomes the successor. Okay. Once Ramanuja turned 100 years old, he never left Shirangam again. So he stayed the remaining 20 years of his life in Shirangam. And he died, he left his body at the age of 120 in 1137 AD in the 12th century. So you see the contrast. To preach Advaita is not so difficult. Everything is one. Accept it. Finished. Shankaracharya, he died at the age of 32. He made all his commentaries, converted everybody, made many ashrams, temples, and then mission finished. Bye-bye. And look how long it took Ramanuja to fix this. <laughs> or to not fix it. Build upon it. Let's do it like that. Not fix it. Build upon it. 120 years he lived. So, actually the physical body, it is, so there's two versions. Again, two versions of the story. One version is that the physical body of Ramanuja became the murti in the temple of Shirangam, which is that murti there, which you see in the photo. You can go into Shirangam and you will see that deity in this temple, in Samadhi temple. It's in the southwest corner of the temple complex. Another version is that the remains of his body are under that deity. So the deity was installed over the remains of his body. Nonetheless, the body is there, but either under or the deity itself. This, depending which who you ask, they'll tell you a different version. Yeah. I asked Guruji, he said, yeah. Said, what, what does yeah mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> so you can go there and you can visit the deity of Shirangam, of Shiramanuja at Shirangam. What did he accomplish? By the time Ramanuja left his body, he had achieved the following. He had established 74 Sri Vaishnava centers throughout India, each of them with an acharya. So 74 sannyasis that he had initiated, swamis, danda, tridandi swamis in each of these 74 ashrams. He had thousands of followers. He had initiated 700 sannyasis and more than 12,000 brahmacharis. Okay. But 74 were considered his primary disciples. They were the heads of the 74 ashrams. So he had, from, from Ramanuja to today, actually you have 74 paramparas. So these different parivars, so different like lines from the disciples of Ramanuja. So Guruji was initiated by Vedavyas Rangaraj Bhatta and he was in the line of Parashara Bhatta. So actually the, the one I mentioned that he gave the name to, that is in the line of Vedavyas Rangaraj Bhatta, who initiated Guruji. But as you all know, now we have the Haribhakta Sampradaya. We are no longer Sri Vaishnavas. Even when we were, we were never really Sri Vaishnavas. We were an offshoot. We were a branch, which is not uncommon. If you know the Ramanandi Sampradaya, the Ramanandi Sampradaya is also an offshoot of the Sri Sampradaya. But now Guruji, it was a very interesting process. For another time, we can talk about it, how the Haribhakta Sampradaya started. Um, but it is a distinct thing. Yeah. Indirectly, of course, we receive the grace of Sri Ramanuja. I spoke to you of the principle of gratitude, like Ramanuja had towards Narayana, towards Mother Lakshmi, who rescued him in the forest after the murder attempt of Yadav Prakash. That gratitude we almost always have. So Ramanuja will always be in our temple. We keep the photos of Ramanuja in our altars, in our various temples, because we come, in a sense, from that line also, yeah? but indirectly. Not directly. That's all the time I have for today. So, 
we went a little bit over. Jay Gurudev, everybody. The life of Sri Ramanuja, in short, we can obviously do much more about his philosophy and teachings and whatever else. Om Shanti 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 Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Hari Om